Uh, I want to welcome everybody out to the Northeastern Region uh, Regional Advisory Council meeting. This meeting is being held in person at the PWR Northeastern Region Vernal Office on uh, December 14, 2023, at 6 o'clock p.m. Um, this public forum allowing everyone allowing you to express your opinions and proposals on the management of the wildlife in our state. Track considers your ideas and opinions, proposals, and reports them to the Wildlife Board. Wildlife Board, not the RAC, is charged with setting the wildlife policy in our state. We all have ideas and opinions about what is best for Utah's wildlife, and we approach this with tremendous emotions and passions. I would encourage all who wish to express their opinion to do so. However, I would ask that we as individuals respect opposing views on the issues you discuss. We appreciate the audience keeping their emotions. And check, allowing all individuals to freely express their opinions. Appropriate conduct will uh, provide smooth meaning flow, allowing the RAC to listen, digest, and address all concerns, opinions, proposals offered for consideration. Rude comments, booing, yelling, hooting, snickering from the audience will, while individual comments are being offered, will not be tolerated. If inappropriate behavior persists, the offender may be asked to leave the meeting. This time, we'll welcome the uh, uh, RAC uh, members here. Uh, my name is, I'll start in, uh, Grizzle Lee, I'm the chair. We'll just go ahead and start with Dusty down the end and work our way through. I'm Dusty Carpenter with the BLM here in Colorado. I'm Rebecca Jones and I represent non-conflict businesses. I'm Nathan Crapo, I represent Public at Large. Natasha Haddon, I'm with the <coughs> U.S. Forest Service. Uh, Richard Bueller with Public at Large. Mark China with Non-Consumptive User. Go ahead and go online there, Jake. Yep, I'm here. Uh, Jake, you go. Hey, um, anybody else online? Eric? Eric Majors, uh, or Major, he's the vice chair. He's going to be running a little bit late. And also Richie Anderson, that represent agriculture here. He's going to be running just a little bit late. Oh, I see. Uh, Tim just... Uh, Chimed in. Tim, you want to introduce yourself? Tim Ignacio, Ute Indian Tribe. Um, thanks, Tim. Um, Mallory Harrison and Brad Horrocks uh, are both excused from meeting night. They weren't going to be able to make it. We'd also like to welcome uh, DWR staff. How do I turn this up, sweetie? Uh, yeah, I'm Miles Hamilton, the regional supervisor. Uh, here to help out the rack. And uh, Randy Durr, a lot of people know why my board's here with us in person. And then I see Gary Nelson, uh, also here from the wildlife board on the line. Okay. Um, I'm So um, we'll move to the approval of agenda and minutes um, from the last meeting. Okay. Move to accept the agenda or the minutes from the last meeting. Natasha has uh, made a motion to accept the minutes from the last meeting. Do I have a second? I'll second Natasha's motion. Okay, Rebecca is second to that. All those in favor? <coughs> Unanimous. Okay. Um, next, we'll uh, give a brief uh, give a summary of the wildlife board meeting uh, from November 28th. Um, <coughs> approval of the on the let's see here motion um, agenda one. It was the uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, mandatory, we'll just start with the mandatory harvest survey. There was a motion made by Bryce Servgood, second by Brett Selman. Um, they moved that they accept the mandatory harvest survey amendments as prevented by the division. The next one was the pronghorn uh, augmentation sites. It was a uh, motion made by Kent Johnson, a second by Paula. 
and passed unanimously to approve the pronghorn augmentation sites as presented by the division. Hunt five or the, the motion five hunt structure research proposal. There was a motion to move that re they reject the division proposal as presented and ask the Mule Deer Committee to discuss the recommendations and bring forth next year. Also ask the committee to include a research project um, with that information, with that study. That following motion was made by Bryce Thurlgood, uh, second by Brett Selman, and it passed four to, month, four to one. Emerging uh, technologies was the next motion, or the next uh, item. Motion was made that they accept the division's proposal as presented, but allow one power or red dot scope, going back to the 2015 definition. Uh, that was made by Gary Nelson, who was seconded by Paula Richmond and passed unanimously. Dedicated hunter program amendments. Um, there was a motion made to accept the division's recommendations and ask the division to prepare an annual report on how the buyout hour dollars are spent. That motion was made by Kent Johnson, second by Bryce Thoroughgood, who passed unanimously. Uh, motion uh, eight was the landowner rule amendments. The first motion made was to move, they accept the division's recommendation to remove the public ask, access requirement from LOAs as represented. That was made by Kent Johnson and Rice Thoroughgood, and that passed unanimously. The next motion was the move, uh, move to accept the division's recommendations to establish a limited entry draw for non LOA lands as presented. That was made by Brett Selman and second by Paul Richmond and passed unanimously. The next motion was underneath the landowner uh, rule amendments was to move to accept the division's recommendation to issue general season landowner permits on private property, allowing up to 10% above the total number of unit permits that could be issued over the counter as presented. And that motion was made by Brett Selman, but it died due to lack of second. There was a following motion on that one made to move to accept the division's recommendations to issue general season landowner permits on private property, but reduce the percentage to 6% above the total number of unit permits that could be issued over the counter. That motion was made by Bryce Thurgood and seconded by Ken Johnson. It passed unanimously. Uh, the next one was the LOA permit recommendations. There was a motion made to move that we accept the division's LOA permit recommendations as presented <coughs> by Brett Selman and Kent Johnson, and that passed unanimously. Next one was the CWMU permit recommendations. The first motion was move that we not issue one additional public lock or bull tag on the double cone CWMU. Um, that was made by Brett, seconded by Kent Johnson. <coughs> The next motion was they move, move to amend the permit recommendations on Gilder Sleeve CWMU from 20 buck deer permits to 10 buck deer permits and from 10 bull elk permits to 20 bull elk permits. That was made by Brett Silman and uh, second by Bryce Thurgood, and that passed unanimously. The next motion on that one was moved to accept the remaining recommendations as presented by the division and ask the division report on units four, five, and six. That was made by uh, Kent Johnson, seconded by Paula, and it passed four to one with recusal from Brett Selma. The next was Landowner Association Advisory Committee members' action. Um, there was a motion made that they accept the division's recommendation to place the following Landowner Association Committee sportsman's representative Troy Justison and Donnie Hewitt Hunter, LOA representative Del Christensen and Andy Monroe, agriculture representative Stephen Tu. At large representative Greg Wilding, rack rep member representing uh, Skew Flannery. And that was made by Paula Richmond, seconded by Brett, and passed unanimously. The next action um, was on the Deep Creek Elk Unit. There was a, there was a motion made to accept the division of uh, Deep Creek Elk Unit recommendation as presented by Kent Johnson and Brett Selman, seconded it, and it passed unanimously. Next motion or action was the move that they accepted it. It was for the Flipless Little Creek Vice uh, South Vice Hunt variants. And if people aren't familiar with that one, the, some of the public hunters had a really hard time finding any bison out there <coughs> during that time period. So they made them accept, uh, accept the division's recommendation to allow those hunters to be able to hunt next year or be able to um, uh, 
there were some other options in there, maybe even con uh, a little extend that hunt, and that was uh, made by Brett Silman, Gary Nelson, and Pastor Hamlin. The last was the corrections to approved controlled list hunt changes under R6573C and R6 57 13. There was a motion to accept the delusions recommendations as presented and by Gary Nelson and Ken Johnson that past year. Okay, we will move on to the regional um, update for Mark. So, um, yeah, there's quite a bit going here on the, in the region right now. Uh, been a busy, busy, really busy fall, it seems like, and moving into the winter. But uh, just have to point out some of these pictures I'm using were part of our regional total contest we, we had. So, we had really a whole lot of really cool pictures submitted by a bunch of our staff, and we had a, a, a total contest. So, it's, it's cool because I get to show you guys on my regional updates with some of these pictures. So. But here's some of the pictures, uh, the events are coming up. We've got the Christmas bird count. That's kind of a national thing that happens in different places around the nation. And uh, we're, we're a part of the Glory National Wildlife Refuge this Saturday to uh, do the Christmas bird count. So people are welcome. Uh, I think you can sign up on the event, right? Or you can talk to Tanya uh, here. She's uh, helping coordinate that, that event. So it's a good event for you know, some more non consumptive type of folks to go out. <coughs> Participating in a Christmas bird count. And it's, uh, that data is used for national uh, conservation efforts for all different types of migratory birds. So that's coming up. Um, I don't have it on here, but there's actually a disabled uh, outdoorsman uh, fishing derby scheduled up in January 6th up at uh, Steininger Reservoir. Heading ice. So <laughs> if we don't have a cooling trend at some of these ice fishing events. Uh, may or may not happen, but uh, but we, we are planning to do the Steinecker Youth Ice Fishing Derby that'll be July 13th. It's a youth event. This is this is from last year, this photo here. So that's a cool event for some of our youth to be able to go out and enjoy some fishing. So we're really hopeful we'll have ice conditions to be able to achieve uh, that event. Some other things are going on. There's a Mac Tack tournament coming up to, uh, on January 13th and 14th at Landing Gorge. This is actually hosted by Buckboard Marina, but it's just a, an event that's really uh, kind of rapidly uh, encourage anglers to harvest small lake trout in Landing Gorge. Uh, those numbers have really skyrocketed over the last mm -hmm. decade and, and are causing some predation issues with Colony Sam. And uh, so we're just working with the folks to try to encourage more harvest on uh, small lake trout. It'll be the Ice Addiction, Addiction Tournament at Steinecker on January 20th. It's been hosted at Steinecker in the last three or so years. Uh, it attracts upwards of 900 and anglers at the time, so it's a really big event. There's some big cash prizes on that as well, so um, that's coming up. And then the Burma Bash Flaming Gorge will be January 26th and 28th. That's another one we're partnering with the uh, Dad County uh, folks and and uh, the Chamber of Commerce up there to host. So that's a good one. Trying to encourage the harvest on them, see some bourbon that are in Lane and Gorge. Uh, so, some other updates in our aquatic section. Trina Hedrick, she promoted to our statewide cold water fisheries uh, coordinated position. So, she just um, made that transition here in the last month. Uh, but she's still uh, based here in Bernal. Uh, so she's still around, but she's, she's moved on. And with that, Natalie Warren, I have a typo there, I see. <laughs> she's replaced uh, she's replaced Trin as our regional aquatics manager. She's been in that position just about a week now. So we're excited to have uh, Natalie. And she's been really worked hard the last several years to improve some of our rural elevation reservoir fisheries and our own water fisheries here in the region. So excited to have her. She gets a lot of experience. Uh, we're going to hold an open house meeting for Flaming Gorge on February 1st. Uh, we'll probably just have right in this, in this room to 
discuss Flaming Gorge and some of the issues we're experiencing out there with small lake trout, culturally declines. We've done a lot of data uh, that we'd like to share with the public and talk about some of the potential management uh, implications coming forward. There have been uh, two previous open houses held in Wyoming and Green River and Evanston that have been well attended by Wyoming residents. And so we're hoping to uh, inform some of our Utah uh, anglers as well by having an open house here in the club. So that's coming up uh, February 1st. And then we'll be doing some drill surveys down at Pelican Lake and it's starting to get right away at December 15th. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll see if there's enough ice for ice anglers to get out. And, Unfortunately, it'll probably be too much ice for uh, boating or to get out, so we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> Habitat, uh, they just finished up three guzzlers that have been installing out in the Bonanza area. We finished those up yesterday, in fact. So that brings a regional uh, guzzler total of uh, over 300 guzzlers we have now. So that's pretty exciting, and each one of those holds at least 1,800 gallons of water. And so it's really a benefit for of animals out in the landscape, so I'm excited about that. Uh, a lot of bull hog work going on. Um, we've got a project that's kind of wrapping up on Wind Ridge and Blue Cliffs, just trying to help out with some of our summer range areas out there and, and knock back some of the community here for encroachment. Uh, there's also a, a project that's in the Forest Service doing some fuel breaks on Red Cloud Loop uh, Road uh, here north of Vernal at South School Masticate. Logical pine. So, we uh, just completed a cable bailing project over on our current creek WMA. And this uh, project is just a couple of D9 sized dozers with a, a large cable and a large drum right in the middle of those. And that drum keeps the cable uh, about 10 feet off the ground and it provides good leverage to pull trees. And so, if you look at this picture, uh, this is after the trees were pulled and, and then piled up, which will be burned in the next couple of years. But if you look in the background, you'll see some of these aspen trees that are actually being encroached over time by the conifer. And the uh, best way to regenerate uh, aspen oftentimes is to get some disturbance and get those trees to, to sprout and, and resucker. And so we're hopeful that we'll get a lot of aspen regeneration coming back in, in these areas. So anyhow, over time, without some sort of disturbance or something to take out these conifers, they, they tend to take over. Um, we have an also, also a timber project uh, on Tabby uh, Mountain uh, in partnership with, with Sitla that also aims to uh, regenerate aspen on that mountain. So those are some projects that are just wrapping up and, and uh, we're looking forward to see what happens in the future. This is the time of year that our biologists are really busy uh, planning new projects. We have a proposal deadline coming up in early January, so people are really busy working with partners and writing proposals to get additional funding for watershed restoration initiative project. Our wildlife folks have been really busy uh, with, with captures the last few weeks. Completed captures on our south slope and then on the book list. These were primarily does and fawns that were captures on the south slope of the book list. And the idea behind that is to track body condition and survival of uh, both adults and fawns. And so we do capture uh, fawns and, and adults on these, cap on these efforts to build a track survival. And that survival uh, rate really help us with uh, some of our models to help us uh, project proper population growth and, and recruitment and things like that. So that's good information for us and uh, really helps uh, secure our actual uh, mortality rates from here, which is really, really crucial for our modeling efforts. Uh, the biologists are wrapping up deer classification. Uh, kind of some preliminary information is that our buck and doe ratios are, are coming in at objective. So uh, they're reporting that they're seeing a uh, good number of bucks and some good large mature bucks as well. So that's encouraging. Uh, probably the best news I've heard those are those fawn ratios are up on most units, uh, which after a really good summer uh, it should be expected, but we uh, could really use a good year of production to recover some of our herds where we lost some this last winter. Uh, one of the things we noticed is the areas that experienced the most severe winter conditions last year actually had lower uh, doe and fawn ratios and lower fawn weights uh, this fall. So it seems like the, the impact and the body condition on some of those does after 
suffering through that hard winter, uh, limited their ability to successfully raise bonds. And then the lower bond rates are, are concerning in that the heavier the bond, the more likely they are to survive this winter. So the light, lighter bonds that we get to very, very much snow and cold conditions, they'll be the ones that are more likely to, to die. So unfortunately, the winter conditions or severe winter is going to have a trickle effect for a couple of years, but uh, hopefully this is a, it's kind of a, a start to a rebalance over population. I will mention, uh, it sounds like initially our book cliffs, uh, low bond ratios, probably the highest they've been in a, a number of years. So that's encouraging to hear as well. And typically we have a good overwinter survival on the book cliffs. Mm -hmm. bonds. <laughs> our yearling survival on the south slope was low. Not a lot of, you know, after the severe winter, uh, we, we lost a lot of those, but unfortunately we continue to lose some of those throughout the summer and into the fall. So, uh, that year in survival is really low on the, on the south slope. So, anyhow, so that's it for the update this, this little round. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will move on to agenda item five, the Utah Black Bear Management Plan Revision Rule, R657-33. And Darren Joyce will swim out support later. Thank you. Um, you want me to give a brief overview, or are we good with the presentation and on your board? Just let me know if you're, you want to add on. Um, maybe, a, uh, maybe kind of just brief overview. Okay, it's well. pretty simple. Um, this is the third year of our Black Bear recommendation cycle, so we're not recommending any permit changes. At this time next year would be the, the time that we come back with permit recommendations for the state. We are asking for two changes, one to the rule and one to the uh, management plan. Uh, the rule change we're requesting is actually in response to something the board asked us to do last year, and that is to make the mandatory orientation course available once a person draws their permit. So if they draw a bear permit, they need to get online, take that orientation course, they need to print out a copy of their certificate or um, download it on their on our app on the phone like they would a license. And they need to have that with them in the field when they're hunting. And so the rule change is just to facilitate that, make that legal. Um, the plan change we're asking for, one of the things we overlooked when we redid the plan last year is the plan requires that we, we take all the units individually and the, the, the committee felt strongly that we wanted to give more autonomy to district biologists to make decisions based on what's going on in their individual districts. The plan still includes a portion that would require a roll-up of all of those harvest metrics and, and that roll-up fall into the moderate category. And those two things aren't really compatible. So we're, we're asking to eliminate that statewide roll-up requirement to allow district biologists to make decisions on a district by district basis. And that's really it. That's all we're asking. Okay, we will um, take any questions from RAC. I guess I have one question. Um, how much flexibility do the biologists have to be able to do permit changes per year? Like, I know you were locked in the three year cycle, right. but just more curious on how much flexibility they have. So, we always have the option if something unusual happens, some emergency arises, to go and make changes mid three year stream. Um, and, and we, you know, everything's always based on the previous three years. So, um, they do have flexibility to do that, but we, we prefer not to. So again, if it's an emergency, we typically bring something to the rats and to the board, but normally we want to stick with it. Um, I did look at the last, using the last three years, just kind of across the state this year, and uh, that's kind of a mixed bag, but I know we'll hear more about some specific units and how some council is concerned about it. So maybe I'll just wait until we Okay. Yeah, I thought, I thought was my one question was if you know, did have some flexibility because I know like the UHA, the Association has some concerns about those within this region. 
I just have one question on the orientation course. Um, what is the reasoning behind that? I know there are several other hunts that still require that. So what's what's the reason behind that? There's there? a couple of reasons. Like one is um, one is to try to make sure that the hunters can differentiate between male and female bears. Or people take male bears. It's not illegal to take a female bear, but just at least they know what the, what the harvest is. The other part is just to there, there's a little bit of an ethics portion where we remind folks that you know, you're sharing the mountain and make sure that you know you're you're representing your sport and sports on well. So those are kind of the two goals of the orientation course. So what's we, the reason between like trying to eliminate that before they draw oh, with other hunts? Right. Still have that orientation. Yeah. You have to do before you apply. A little bit of background. So we uh, when the bear committee met last year, we actually recommended making that not a mandatory course. And the board felt like they still wanted people to have to take that, but if you had when, when you before you had to take that before you could even put in for a bear permit, and that means that whether you drew out or not, you took it. And some folks felt like you know, if they're trying to put in for their kids and, and family members, that, that was just a lot of extra time they had to spend and they weren't guaranteed to have the permit. So the board wanted to keep a mandatory, but they also recognized that that can be a burden for families. And so so they they wanted us to make it. So you still had to take it, but you could take it after you drew and you had to. And the recommendation just to be cleared up was they as soon as they draw off and they need to go in yeah. and take it, will they get their permit before they draw or before they take it? Or yeah, will it be one of those things? They could. Of they, they need to take it before they go into the field. So, gotcha. um, we did ask about, you know, is there a way to prevent them from getting the permit before until they take the permit logistically, just with the way things work with licensing? That just wasn't possible. So. I have one more quick question, just to clarify the um, the concerns that some of the user groups have brought up about the number of permits. When would that? What like when would some of the concerns that UHA brought up about permits be considered? Next year is when we're scheduled to do permit recommendations across the board. So what we'll do is there's two things that biologists will be able to do. First of all, they'll be able to have their they'll be able to choose their hunt strategy with a new plan. They can choose you know light moderate or liberal and that depending on which they choose that that determines where their their harvest metrics need to fall and so um so once they choose that they'll look and see what the previous three year average was for male bears five years and older and the percent of females in the harvest and then depending on how those shake out they'll make a recommendation to either reduce increase whatever they are and our, the plan does give them some cycles on you know, the, the amount they need to for example if both are out in a negative way that's usually a 20 to 40 percent adjustment to, to permits and um, they could go the other way if they're out in a positive way they, they still do 20 to 40 percent they may be reducing or, or increasing permits more so that's kind of how it works that'll be next next december all of that and then we'll, that'll be for the next three years. So on the on the heels of the, the harsh winter last year, some of the concerns are specific to the upcoming year. Right. If it does the district biologist or this area have any? Yeah, they, they could if, if they had a lot of concerns. Bears tend to react slow, and obviously they, they hibernate in the winter. So what really affects them is fall production on landscape. Mm -hmm. So if we have a crop, mass crop failure in the fall, we may see fewer cubs being born. Um, that's all taken into account in the three-year cycle. And so unless, unless something really drastic happens, typically we won't, we won't recommend a change. Um, but drought has been an issue, especially in the southern units. And so, um, and, and the overall state model does seem to show a leveling off of a decline and then you know, that's statewide and so you know we've got folks here locally if you're interested to know what they're seeing on the book for example they can answer some more details of it. any other questions questions from the RAC members online 
Okay, we'll move to the questions from the public. I have a question. Um, my name is Jason Binder. Um, what was our, our harvest percentage last year on bears? Statewide? Yeah. It depends on the hunt. So success was low on the spring hunt because folks weren't able to, because of the hard winter, they, they weren't able to get up there. Um, it was a little higher for summer on the boat, Jason. So oh, I'm going to break it down by hunt if that's okay, Jason. Okay. So spring 20% statewide, summer was 55% statewide, fall was 23%, and then the spot stock success rate. So this would be during the, the general season, the game hunts was 36%. And that's a quota. So that doesn't mean that 36% of people with bear tags got a bear. It means 36% of the quota was filled. That makes sense. Okay. And then do you have the sow harvest rate for last year? Statewide, it was 42%. Okay. And then one other question I have is what was the survival rate of cubs last year with the uh, harsh winter that we had? With, with the bears that we have collared and um, bears we, we don't here. we don't estimate that i you know maybe maybe the local biologists have, have a sense for what they saw when they did bears my general sense was that it looked like production was a little bit below but they may know more do you anybody know randall did you you have a sense for that in the book let's see if i can find it okay thank you yeah Any other questions for the public? Just one question on the, the mandatory, just in the mandatory, you have to take that to get the, but the permit's going to be sent out before. So Potentially, yeah. So you, you'd find out you drew, you'd know you needed to take that class before you could go into the field. So yeah, potentially you could get your permit, but if you don't have that proof that you took the class in the field, then you're stopped by an officer. You'll have a discussion about so you why have to carry that happen. with you. Yeah, and but you can either have it on your phone or you can print off the paper and stick it with your license. Make sure you yeah, say your name when you ask a question. Any other questions from the public? Okay, we'll move on to electronic comments from the public. Okay, we had two people, only two people uh, actually uh, respond on black bear proposals. One of them strongly disagreed, one strongly agreed. So, uh, pick, pick, I guess. But um, the comment that was made by the person that strongly disagreed they felt like you cut tags and, and have no pursuit tags during the hunts, and they were concerned about the number of mature bears. Okay, so we will move on to the rack or public comments. And we have one public comment for this one, and it is uh, Jason Binder. My name is Jason Binder. Um, I'm just here representing myself. Last year we came to the, the rack meeting, and uh, there was a strong concern about. The number of, of bears being harvested and sticking with the same amount of tag numbers. Um, there's been several studies done in the state that, uh, for some reason, as a um, wildlife management unit, we don't use those studies. They were done by uh, Hal Black that did a lot of studies out in the foothills. And those studies showed that anytime you harvested more than 25% sows, you're damaging the population. And here again, we just heard this year we're at. 42%. That's way too high of a sow harvest to uh, allow the bears to keep continuing to produce. Um, also, seeing last year's winter, um, a lot of, I feel we lost a lot of bears in the winter, plus a lot of, a lot of cubs. I've had hounds for, for 30 years and been, been hunting a long time. 
actually had the opportunity to hunt third across the state several times this last year. And I'm glad to see the concern being brought up by the rack that um, tag numbers could potentially be too high. Um, Darren says that um, certain things can trigger cutting tags um, mid process. I think that's something we really need to look at because these, these bears aren't going to recover like a coyote or a lion or a fox or anything like that. It's going to it's take a long time before we, we get these bears back. And so I, I would like to see um, you guys really consider some tag numbers. I know you've got the um, recommendation from the Townsman Association. I think they're recommending um, cutting 10 tags on each of the four main units. Um, I'd like you guys to really consider that. Take time to talk it over and think about it. Appreciate your time. Thank you. That's the only one. Okay. Okay, we will move on to any more rack comments, discussions. Um, just is there, is there a biologist here, Miles, that can talk to some of the numbers and concern? Um, <coughs> Randall, or, well, Ben's not here, obviously, but Randall or Dallas. <coughs> <up there. coughs> okay, so Dallas Christensen, the wildlife manager, what uh, the numbers specifically? Like bear dens? Yeah, like the, just the bear, like, Population numbers for RBHM that some folks have brought up concern over? Uh, you know, we, we, we have heard some concerns over specifically the book list. Um, book list is a unit that for a long time has just been considered a trophy unit. <coughs> and we, we focused harvest on book list quite, uh, quite a lot lately, uh, mostly due to pond predation. Uh, we were finding that uh, bears were taking a significant portion of those yield their fawns when they were first born for the first two months. Um, as far as numbers last year, it was hard uh, to make it up to the bear dens in the springtime because of all the snow that we had. We have several collared bears in Brooklyn, and I just texted him. He was only able to make it to two dens. I think he has nine collared bears, but he was only able to make it to two. And of those two, not neither one of them had um, had cubs this year. So, uh, as far as overall numbers, it's just a guesstimate. Um, yeah, bears are very loose. So if it's a guesstimate, um, how do recommendations for um, you know mid-cycle plan reductions or increases? So that's a good question. Maybe Darren would see you guys talk to that. I think just an overview. So we would talk about 42% of emails. Um, it, it really depends on the unit and what the management objective is. So if we're trying to reduce black bears, then yeah, you want to have very high female harvest, but um, we don't use population as a as a metric in the plan. We use two metrics. One is the number of fours five years and older. That's in order to try and maintain a, an older age. Again, it depends on the harvest strategy. For a light harvest, we want to have more older bears. That's more of a trophy kind of kind of unit management strategy. Um, or for a unit where you're trying to reduce bear numbers, you want, those, you want to see those older bears not showing up in population future to reduce population. Um, so adult bears, five years, male bears, five years and older is one. And the other is a percent females. The thinking that there is that you know higher percentages of females, as Jason mentioned, indicate a, a decline in, in population. And, and the population model I included in our um, presentation shows that, that it looks like we probably peaked somewhere in 2018, and since then we've seen a decline. And, and the, the percent females statewide over the last three years, we've seen them keep that as well. Also, bear in mind that well, that model shows that we probably had a higher population of bears, you know, over the last five or six years than we have. In the last 20. So we we're starting at a fairly high population density, but we are starting to see a possible decline. Does that help? Yep. So just a couple of things that caught my attention as we've been discussing this. Um, the first thing that caught my attention is. Um, we talked specifically about book cliffs. I know that's one of the areas that people have been suggesting 
meeting Miles' presentation, we talked about the close here are we looking as good or better than it has in a while. So is that one of those areas that many people talked about a few bears that they were able to check in their dads that don't have cubs. We don't know that those bear numbers are declining with your owners. And we can really, uh, in my mind, that was justified. And if you well, I mean, I'm hoping we'll look for this area, look at those numbers, those bear tag numbers. The other thing that caught my attention is when we were talking about harvesting sows. Um, this orientation course is kind of really not me because there are certain hunts that still require you to do that before you can apply. Um, dedicated hunter, <clears throat> swans, um, I believe there's a buffalo. And if harvesting sows is really affecting, and that's what this orientation course, I have a look at the orientation course today before I came. And that's what it's all about, is harvesting sows um, and how to determine the difference between a sow and a boar. Um, in my mind, if I mean, if, if we want as it is, if the division wants to make that across the board, that that orientation course is not required until after you drop from it, I think that's a great idea. But I think if it's there on these other hunts and it's helping people determine the sow from a boar, I, I still like the idea of keeping it mandatory and that can definitely help and affect the bear numbers because how many people? may go out and hunt and overlook that um, and not have that um, education to be able to tell us out from the board. So um, I'd like to clarify a little bit on the, the deer and stuff like this. Um, the population has been kind of declining and it is pretty low really right now. So but we are encouraged to see that we have uh, a lot better fawn uh, recruitment this year. So our overall population is still pretty low. And it's a positive sign that it's good weather. Uh, hopefully, we'll see some growth in that population. Is there any thought that the um, more bear harvest has helped with the pond survival lately? We don't. So uh, our neonate data comes from uh, 2019 through 2021. We actually have Daniel who conducted the research here in the room with us. Um, during that time period, uh, we experienced an, uh, an average of 15% of our collared fawns were being killed by bears within the first two months. Um, since then, you know, that was a couple years ago. We don't have a recent study or, or data, but uh, that was from that study. 15% uh, of neonates or, or you know, newborn fawns were being taken by bears. Add to that real quick. We do have data from last year on the little sows on the San Juan, which is not the same as the book cliffs, obviously, but the bear densities are, are similar. And it, it, that has remained fairly consistent. I think on the San Juan, it was 19% of neonate fawns, and on the little sows, it was 14% last year. So that's more recent. Just seems to be a constant. One thing to remember, too, though, about bears is that they'll they tend to take them during that that young phase, but then once they get mobile, it's less of a less of an impact. Miles, did you say the book cliffs the deer seem to be probably off or just or are they still in decline? Uh, up until this year, it's still been declining. Uh, yeah, it's been a downward trend, but we're encouraged by. It. Yeah, I expect to see the deer herd a lot worse than it is after the winter we had, so that's encouraging for sure. It's a fine line, isn't it? I mean, to sustain a thing is, I think the number, the, the, the top two hunting opportunities in Utah and sought after opportunities are deer and elk. From the the number two, the, the highest two hunting opportunities. Those are probably the two we give the most permits and have the most applications for you. So, I mean, we, we need to have a sustained bear population and opportunities for houndsmen and those you know, like to hunt bear, but uh, number one and number two, the man's deer and elk. And the greatest opportunity for people to hunt is. Here. 
far as accessibility in this I tend to lean more towards making sure we sustain those populations and still try to, to have a sustainable bear and cougar and coyote. Bear and, bear and cougar have, have opportunities for bear and cougar hunts as well. So I'm okay with seeing right now in bear numbers until we level out our depletion of the population. Has there been discussion in the state before right, about only harvesting boars, not? King's house, or is it just too hard? I guess I'm not. Um, you know, those discussions have been had when we do bear committees. Um, there's two things you hate to put a, a sportsman in a position where, you know, if they, if it's necessary, yes, but if they make a mistake, I'm thinking like, you know, I, I managed the cashews, we had mountain goats, and we had nanny only hunts. And, and it was really hard to see some kid shoot Billy that was with a kid because he thought it was a, a nanny and, and get into trouble. You know, so we try to avoid that. But having said that, you know, if it was a real issue, yeah, we, we certainly could, could do something like that. Um, just real quick, I was just looking at the last three years on the book clips. This is Bitter Creek South. So just, just as you're discussing this, um, that is currently within the range of the light harvest strategy. So it's a uh, little, the roadless is different. It's, it's outside of the, the Bitter Creek over the last two years is again in that light strategy. It's currently within the parameters. I have to say that I'm also leaning towards um, you know, what the division has proposed because if you have a reactive um, decision, because you're just seeing a, a dip, there's always cycles in wildlife populations and um, allowing for management strategies to expand over several years rather than year to year is sometimes a, um, a better strategy just in terms of wildlife management and maintaining population. But can we 50% depredation is big. That's huge. If I lost 15% of my cat crop, which I did this last year, that's devastating to a herd. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I think we're losing tons of deer. Probably there. For sure. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's pretty hard to sustain a herd that kind of loss. Compounded by the hunt pressure. Maybe. <clears throat> that 15% just for the process? I think that's like what was where the book was when we looked at it. There's a couple of things with, you know, we're talking about six months, zero to six months, 15% of those spawns, they die from a lot of things. So we do expect a certain, you know, if I was a livestock producer, yeah, that, that with wildlife, you, you can accept a certain amount of that. So the other part of this is what is your spawn to go ratio looking like in the fall? And that's, if you've got a problem in the fall, yeah, you want to look back and see why are we losing so many fawns? And, at least on the LaSalle's, it's, it's about equal lion and bear. The difference, though, is that lions tend to keep taking, they can take any age class, they take them year round. Bears kind of get this, you know, they get a short crack out of them while they're young and then they, they don't usually kill adults. But, but yeah, you're right. And that's It's definitely concerning, so definitely keep an eye on it. 15% was just for bear. Right, yeah. Yeah, there were, there were a lot of different still there are a lot of stillborns for some reason down there this year. It may be a hard winter thing and that may not be sustained over time. There more stillborns than bears. Lions about the same. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other stuff, but those are those are kind of the top 
the causes of mortality in this little theory. Just to clarify it, uh, next year there's the, the plan will be reviewed 2024. Yeah, yeah, this, the schedule of recommendations is every three. So, uh, so next year we will be coming with permit recommendations and adjust accordingly. And I, I was just looking at these numbers again, and I did just to make sure the record's clear for Bear Creek South. One is within the parameters. So 28% females, there should be less than 30. So that's where it should be. Um, but um, I was looking at the wrong line. So 33.8% adult males, and that should be 35% more. But again, that's light harvest. So if the biologist decides to change that strategy, that all changes. Any other rack comments or discussion on it? Call for uh, anybody have a motion they'd like to make on this one? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to accept the proposal for the use of Blackberry's management plan provisions as proposed by the division of all leads. Okay, Natasha has uh, made a motion to accept the division's recommendations. I we'll have a second. I'll second the motion. Um, it was uh, seconded by Rebecca. Okay, we'll take a vote. Start with Dusty. Uh, yes. Okay, Richie. Yes. Rebecca. Yes. Nate. Yes. Natasha. Yes. Richard. Yes. Mark. Yes. Okay, we'll go online and start with Jake. Yes. Hey, Tim. Yeah. And then we'll move to Eric. Yes. Yes. Okay. Passes unanimously. Okay. We will move on to the uh, elk management plan um, <coughs> portion of the agenda. Daniel. So we, yes. Okay. Yeah, so um, last year the statewide health management plan was um, amended or changed, updated. Um, and this year we were updating all of the unit plans uh, to reflect the statewide changes and also to allow um, changes to the population objective um, uh, changes in the unit plans. We're taking eight units through the rack and board process that have population changes, as well as two units were split so the south slope unit was split into the yellowstone as one separate unit now and then the mountain Myrtle bonanza is um, one unit now and then the central mountains unit was divided into the nebo and the anti um, for this region i just mentioned the split between the yellowstone and the diamond we're also recommending a population decrease on the yellowstone unit the current population objective is 5,000 elk and we're recommending a decrease down to 3,500 elk. Um, the main reason we're doing that is that um, we're no longer counting elk that are on the Ute Tribal Trust land into our population estimate. The Division of Wildlife doesn't have any management authority over elk that are on that Ute Tribal Trust land, so we're no longer counting them for our objectives. I can go over the other units if you like. Um, I do have one question in the presentation. It talked about a, and you may not know it, there was a, a proposal in, for a landowner hunt in the UN Basin. It's like 2024, I believe it was in there. There's a the landowner only bull hunt. I was going to ask the same thing. Uh, Just kind of curious on it. I was, don't know about that, but these guys probably do. Just kind of more curious on how far they were in the process, timing, that type of deal on it, I guess. So, yes, there is a proposal. Um, it's something that uh, was taken through the statewide health plan last year to have uh, something kind of outside the normal um, general season updates. And uh, especially in areas where we don't have much management authority, uh, such as around new tribal land or around, around the national monuments. Um, so, yes, we included language in both the, the South Slope and the uh, 
the Colonel Bonanza Diamond plants have a private land in the tank. Um, the idea is behind, behind that is to, to allow landowners to have a kind of give them another tool to manage depredating elk. Um, we have large populations of elk that, that never really make it up to the mountain to live the majority of their life on private lands uh, or on tribal lands next to private lands. So the idea is to um, kind of give another tool to those landowners so that they can harvest more outside of the regular season dates. Is that is there any dates set? Is it just a proposal right now and it's just in the it's just a proposal right now. There are no dates set. Um, if, if it passes, we plan, on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we plan on hopefully having something next year to take through in the fall and then in 2025. Are there any other questions from the rack on this uh, so, elk management? I think, didn't I agree in here that um, yes, you're decreasing the population objective for the, the units out here, but the thought it, but it's actually maybe an increase due to the way you counted, is that? Yeah, so that was kind of driven by us no longer counting elk on that you land. Um, so from what I understand, these guys can clarify it better if I get it wrong. But from what I understand, um, having our population objective on the public land drop down to 3,500 elk um, and no longer counting the elk, um, we can have, we can allow for about 500 more elk. So I guess right now there's about 3,000 elk on the public land and with an objective 3,500 that could possibly increase. I'm awful for more elk, I guess, but it's the landowners, I guess. Yes. Behind, okay, with the increase too. So um, when we made these population objective change changes, um, we had committees meet, local committees meet, comprised of um, like the Farm Bureau, cattlemen, wool growers, and um, some individual landowners themselves, as well as sportsmen um, and other groups. So there was um, definitely representation from the landowners there and several of those landowners there as well. One more question for me is, so is the book clips not included because there's no change? Yeah, so um, we're only bringing the plans through the rack and board process to have changes to population objectives, and there was no recommended change in the book clips population objective. Hasn't there been discussion about that, I guess, in the past? Because the herd isn't doing good? I, yeah, but it was decided not. Yes, yeah, so there, there has been, in fact, a few years ago, I think we actually we talked about lowering the objective because it's quite high compared to where our population is now. But uh, we still have hope uh, to increase the population, and, and for now, we decided to leave it where it, where it is. Is there any update on what it's doing this year? I guess. The... Oh, I I don't have any for you right now. Sorry, I can get that up to you. Um, it it uh, this past winter you know, we had a lot of snow, uh, and both the elk and deer had actually fared better out there than what they did across the south slope. Um, even though they had significant amount of snow out there, they fared quite well. We're, we're not voting on the, the landowner program tonight, right? That's the proposal will come later. So the, the hunt itself will come later, but the ability to implement it, we are voting on. Okay, I'm just, I'm just sure it's okay. Any other questions from the rack? You guys online have any questions? I've got a few questions. Go ahead, Richie. Sorry, how many of these? It's been a few days since I watched it. How, how many of these uh, eight units are under objective now? And how, how many are over? How many are under? Good question. Um, I don't know specifically. I know the two of them are over objective. Right. Um, so in Box Elder, um, we're recommending an objective change in one of the subunits. Right now, that management, so that subunit has an objective of zero. Um, the recommendation is to increase that to 400 elk. There are currently about 600 elk in that, in that subunit. And then the Morgan um, Southridge area, um, the current objective is 3,800 elk. Um, our recommendation is 4,200, and there's about 6,700 elk. 
Um, the rest of them, I'm not 100% sure, but I think they're all at or slightly below Jeff. What's the yes, what's the population estimate for the South Slope, Thermal, and Yellowstone? <laughs> so the South the South Slope, uh, the South Slope Yellowstone, right current population estimate, including the tribal ground, is about seventy five hundred elk. Um, without you know, going back and looking at our previous flights and, and data, without counting the new tribal land, we're sitting between twenty five hundred and three thousand basically. Um, Pretty much right there, I guess. We're, we're pretty close. Yeah. And in fact, we're, we're scheduled to fly this spring. And if we continue to have a winter like we're having, we, we may be right where we're supposed to be, where we're hoping to be. I have a quick question about the counting. Are you, how are you counting the checkerboard elk that are down in Willow Creek? In Willow Creek? Mm -hmm. um, on the, the booklets? Uh -huh. Willow Creek? Okay. And between all the checkerboard landowners. Okay. Uh, historically, we, we, we fly a grid flat pattern and we, we count everything that we see in factor and sightability. And so, in booklets, for example, whether it's you try to figure out, I guess. Okay. So, there's quite a bit of crossover in the Yellowstone units with the tribal elk and yes. non tribal, I guess you could say. Um, Depends on the day. Right. So, how are you going to manage the population objective if you have 6,000 elk, say, in the summertime? And maybe you have 3,000 elk in the fall and winter. I mean, or, you know, I, I guess, yeah. It's just, uh, I'm a factor. I'm the biologist for the Yellowstone for the last 27 years. Um, yeah, and that is the hard thing. The Yellowstone is a unique unit in the state because of this tribal land that cuts. There's a, just so everybody knows, there's not a big strip, uh, several hundred thousand acres of tribal land that cuts kind of right through the middle of the unit, runs east west. It's essentially a lot of the winter range is on the tribe. That's down through there. So I think most of you kind of know kind of where it is. Um, and so it is a, an issue of, of a lot of these elk do leave, move up onto the forest for the summer, uh, go to the high country, a lot of them, and then and then they'll move down to the winter. Uh, and in the winter, a lot of them do winter on the, on the tribe. Like it's, you know, it's probably kind of approximately two thirds of them will winter on the tribe. Line. Some do, depending on the winter and the severity of the winter, a lot of them will push down even farther. They'll push down past the tribe and move on to some of the agricultural land. That's when we have a lot of the complex problems. Uh, and those kind of things would happen too. So. But they, we, we do get that move, and that's been the hard thing. Um, the numbers, as far as what's there, Richie, it's what's always got. I mean, we have for since 2012, roughly, we've had about the same population. It grew in 2012 when, when uh, we, we stopped having the, the Utah tribe elected to stop harvesting amphorous animals and all on their property. Before that, they had a fair number of tags and they're very high success numbers of hunts. They helped remove some of the amphorous animals on, on, across the tribe land. And, when that stopped, that we did get an increase in the population up there, and we've kind of gone hog wild almost with amphorous permits trying to, to keep this elk population down and things like that. Uh, the problem is, during that time, of course, uh, there's been no hunting pressure on the tribal land, so they've all moved on. For the most part, they've learned more and more. Elk are very smart, they go where there's no pressure, and so they move more and more on the tribal land. All our wintering population objectives in the whole state are for wintering population objective numbers. And so that's what we've tried to try to manage for. Uh, even though the elk were there in the summer, we had them on allotments and up on the forest, all that kind of stuff all summer. They would, they, the hard part is when they come down, that was the number we were put, charged to manage to the population. And so uh, we have no authority uh, to do anything on, on tribal lands. That is the sovereign nation, in case everybody doesn't know that. Uh, and so when they move down there, it makes it really difficult us to be able to put that. And so what we tried to do now is try to target our antlerless harvest, our which manages population really is removing cows. We now try to target that and try to call for different tools. And we're trying to put enough pressure down below on the below the tribal boundary that whenever the elk show up down there they can be harvested through public land. That's why we have the private lands only antlerless permits that we started a number of years ago. That's been very successful and worked really well. We're recommending that we start having some of these 
private land only bull tags in the future. And as Grace said, it won't be this year, but by 2025, that will be there. Uh, because we have some areas where folks have been killing a lot of cows down low, and what they have now is just a, you know mostly bulls. <laughs> and so we need some another tool to let people be able to address that when those animals come down off the off the tribal land onto the private land. And some pressure to them. So it is complicated. We will see. We, we kind of we put in the plan. We committed to continue to to fly, to keep an idea, and buy these on, on a you know a few years even, and even fly over some of the tribal land to do some things. So we at least know kind of what's going on there. Uh, so we, the population doesn't blow up to, you know, three or 4,000 extra more elk without any of what we aren't aware of. We don't want to have a problem like that. We, what we do, we intend to try to keep an idea there. We work with the Ute tribe uh, every year. We work with them. They try to do a survey flight every year, the tribe does. And so we can, uh, we get their data and work with them too, and coordinate with them, and try to work with them on, uh, you know, any hunts and those kinds of pressure and things like that those interface areas because it is very general for lots of parts of the Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions from the rack? Okay, we'll move on to questions from the public and remember if you have a question, state your name first, please. Okay, we will then look like we have any uh, questions from the public. We'll move on to the electronic comments from the public. We had three people respond on the elk uh, plan updates. Um, kind of across the board again, we had 33%. One of them strongly disagreed, one of them strongly agreed, and one uh, somewhat agreed. The comment was, and I think this is the first that uh, strongly disagreed, they just wanted to see more elk and deer, or more elk on the Yellowstone rural units. So that was the comment. Okay, we will move to the public comment section. Do we have any public comment cards? Okay, we will first start with Jaron Hansen. Uh, Jaron Hansen, uh, Utah Farm Bureau. Uh, the Utah Farm Bureau Federation is in support of these recommendations. Uh, these units went through a lot of robust and collaborative uh, process between ranchers, sportsmen, the DWR, and other stakeholders uh, to come up with a common sense approach to address the needs of the wildlife grazers. Uh, we appreciate the ongoing efforts to manage elk on private cultivated lands and range grounds and look forward to continued relationship with the UWR. So, thank you. Thank you. We have one more uh, comment, uh, public comment from Bob Christensen. I just want to <clears throat> express my support for the elk unit management plans. Well, specifically the South Slope Yellowstone and the South Slope Bonanza. Um, just as someone that uh, has done a lot of, a lot of elk hunting in the past, um, what can be noticed is that elk, they head off the mountain, majority of them, 80% plus, maybe head down off, off the uh, public land, off the forest, and down on the, on the tribe and on the private lands during the hunt, by the time the rifle hunt happens. Uh, a lot of the elk are concentrated to the left on public land or concentrated around the, the perimeter of the first few miles of the forest boundary. Um, um, I acknowledge that there's, depends on the year, the variability on years, and just a, just a handful of elk do stay up high, but the majority come down. And so for a, a sportsman, for a hunter, it's, um, you're concentrating everybody right there on the, around the perimeter. Um, so that's where, where all the elk are. And uh, uh, the time muzzle or uh, rolls around, you would have less of the elk than on, on public land. They're all on tribal pri and private. You can see herds of um, hundreds of elk down on the tribe and, and on private. <clears throat> and I, I think it's a really, uh, really good that those private, those cow elk permissive kind of private land have been uh, working really well to try to put pressure back on those elk, push them back up on the public land. And I think the bull elk only hunt will be really good as, as well to help put that pressure down there to get those elk back up on the public plan. Um, the, uh, as far as season dates, I know that's not being discussed right now, but I <clears throat> I guess what, what I would feel for future discussion is that, that whatever pressure is up on the forest, public pressure, there should be an equal amount of pressure down below on private land as well. 
helps with those outcomes. Um, as soon as the archery starts, the one that was or for August to November, maybe, maybe even earlier. And so I'm in full support of that. I, I like the idea of uh, only counting the elk on public lands that's in the management authority of the division of wildlife. Um, that is a, is a good move in the right direction. And uh, so that's, I just throw my support behind the uh, um, management plans and I would hope that the RAC is all in the way. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any more public comments out there? <clears throat> okay, we will move on to the any more uh, rack comments discussion. So I visited with <clears throat> several ranchers today in different parts of the state. Um, someone involved in the process. I tried to talk to ranchers that are in the, the units that are uh, close to the change. Some of them support it, some of them don't. Um, that can be expected, but the uh, couple couple concerns I heard and I appreciate is we had a good moisture winter, spring, fall. We had a pretty good vegetation year, and so that's something. And some of the concern was maybe we ought to give it a year, a few years, and see if this is sustainable because we're driving hell already right now, you know. And so uh, that was some of their concern is say, let's, let's go take a, a decent year of vegetation and automatically jump those numbers. Um, a lot of them was fairly supportive, willing to try it. Uh, there's been some deals made with the division, and um, some in writing, some verbally, that uh, the winter supported or whatever. That, there will be some different type management uh, things implemented and, and we're supportive of that and um, support those agreements that were made. Um, yeah, that, you know, I, I support the Farm Bureau's position. I'm fine with it. Um, but not all ranchers and farmers are Farm Bureau members either. There's a lot that aren't that have concerns about it, but generally speaking, the ranchers were fairly supportive, kind of let's give it a try type feeling. Um, one of the issues we have is a lot of us, some people were mandated either by BLM or the Forest Service during the drought years, they had to reduce their grazing numbers, which that's expected. Many ranchers voluntarily, like myself, we voluntarily reduced our stocking rates. Like fair amount. We're not back there yet. We're, a lot of us have and have had for 20, 30 years on our allotments. We've had suspended AUMs, meaning we're allowed so many AUMs, but they were suspended years ago for drought, whatever reason they suspended them. They never gave them back. We've never gone back. We can't get them to give us those suspended AUMs back so that we can get back to our stocking rates. Um, and so it's a little bit tough. We're hoping by supporting increasing elk populations or whatever. And some of these units, the rancher said, hey, there's, there's been habitat work done uh, or proposed. We want to see it, you know. Habitat has improved in there. And so they was positive on that aspect. So we're hoping that supporting an increase in uh, objective numbers on some of these units, that we can in turn get some support to restore our, our numbers as well and try to rebuild from our situation that was caused by drought. So, um, but generally speaking, I think everybody taking things, um, and I think that's a really awesome thing that we're going after the cheap grass on that. So, 
just I'm pulling a Bill Bates. He's for press. He'd always get up to the stand and talk when it wasn't his turn. And but Mr. Chair, if it's all right, I just wanted to say say what they I'm Dax maybe some of the big game coordinator and, and Daniel's done done me a big favor by taking these plans around and done this rack tour, but just kind of building on, on what Dusty said, just one example on the Southwest Desert unit, which is a pretty controversial unit, you know, for, for elk. Um, you know, if you go to any of the Southern Region Rack meetings, there's some strong feelings about elk numbers down there. And in the last five years since the last plan cycle, they did a habitat treatment on over 30,000 acres of elk habitat, another 30,000 acres that weren't elk habitat, but where they do have domestic livestock grazing. Uh, in conjunction with working with federal partners, they rounded up over 6,400 wild horses and took those off the range. And, and they spent over $19 million to raise the objective 175 elk. That's an expensive 175 elk. You know, it probably would have been cheaper for somebody to step in and, you know, buy folks' base properties and their permits and or something like that. But that's not how we want to do this. We want to maintain the partnerships that we have. We want to ma maintain you know, working multiple use lands that, that benefit different segments, different constituencies. And, you know, I'm really proud of our folks and work they've done with partners too. It's not just all division, it's it's permittees, it's landowners, it's it's federal partners, it's state partners. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to highlight that, that there's, there's a lot of work that goes into this and nobody wants to set ourselves up to be in a situation where, you know, we make someone that we're supportive of restoration of AUMs when, when the habitat is there. And uh, we just feel like, if we do good things at this scale, it, you know, it's going to help everybody out. Just, I just wanted to add that and I appreciate you guys' comments and thoughtful and support. And I, I do want to clarify too that the, the ranchers, most of them that I talked to today, they felt like they did have an increased presence in the process. This, this go around on, on these proposals. Uh, they, they did feel like they had a little bit of better influence. A few of them I talked to didn't have a clue that. There was even a proposal, but generally speaking, the ranchers felt like they did have a, a, a better, but they were included better. So appreciate that. Eric, you got a comment? Go ahead. Yep, I was just going to kind of piggyback off that too. I attended the uh, elk. Club, elk. Oh, what was it called, Randall? Just that that group, and there was quite a few landowners represented, and and I felt like that was a good discussion. There's a lot of discussion about this private land bull tag, and and uh, you know having another opportunity where not just landowners, but someone that could get permission, you know, could could buy one of those permits, and and in some ways, as a public land hunter, that would be someone that probably, I mean. They wouldn't be able to hunt the public land if they have that private land tag, but the the pressure will help um, spread that pressure around and and keep some pressure there. I think my only concern with that was this the, the fact that uh, that permit probably will turn fairly valuable, especially if there's some more liberal seasons. Um, if there's you know maybe an earlier hunt with the rifle that's still in the rut, and those that are having help on their property from August and September and onward and, and getting those elk in their fields, it will be a good opportunity for them, but it also could present itself into a, you know, kind of a money thing as well. But I think that's another tool again, that can help uh, with some of these depredating elk. I guess my concern with that, the monetary side is, it seems like hunting is getting more and more a rich man's sport and that, that could turn into a fairly valuable, not necessarily, Certainly selling the tag, but trespass fees to allow people to come hunt those bulls on private. But I did feel like there was a good representation there at that meeting, and um, I definitely support this plan. Thanks. Thank you. Anything else? Are we done? I forgot. I promised a rancher I'd bring one thing. And, and this is a little bit off topic, so I'll just try and bring it up. Indian Peak unit over on the Nevada line. And, and he's more concerned in visiting with his sportsman. He feels like the way that Utah hunts that area and the way that Nevada hunts it is given an unfair advantage to the Nevada hunters. And the Utah hunters are getting pretty discouraged. So just take a look at that Indian Peak, that Nevada line. We hunt that a lot longer than Nevada does and does different things. 
and he's a rancher, but he said, my, he talked to the hunters, he said the hunters are pretty discouraged in that area. It feels like we're pushing those out to Nevada. They're getting the cream of the crop, and we're not getting there. Thank you. I'll just ask one more question. Just to clarify, um, with these private land bull tags, I think it was asked earlier tonight, like, are we, are we voting on that right now? It was a, it was, I mean, your comment was, yeah. We, we are, we are not, like, because several comments from other people make it sound like we are, and so I just want to clarify. Okay. So, so you're not voting on having a season next year, but you're voting on the new language and the, uh, um, basically the ability to do it in the future years. Uh, for the instance, uh, you're voting on that, the ability to do it. Not an actual season, uh, season dates, if, if it already is to pass, do it on the season dates and permit numbers. Uh, for 2025. Yes, thank you. Any other comments, discussion? I guess I have one, one last thing would be with these increase in numbers, you know, mule deer have really suffered. Is there any thought that ink with the increase of the elk population is that affecting a mule deer? I'm all for that elk. I do most of my elk hunting because there's not much mule deer anymore. But yeah. yeah, so there, I mean, there are certain areas where it does seem like there's evidence that increased elk do hurt mule deer. Um, there's other areas where we haven't seen evidence of that. Um, but that was considered um, when talking about these population objective changes. Um, these local committees were pretty much have the best knowledge of what's going on there. And we, there was no intent to try to hurt the field deer populations. We're just trying to take advantage of habitat increases that have occurred. Um, so as far as our best guess is, the, the changes we're proposing won't have the it's mainly driven by habitat improvements. There's no other comments. Um, call for motion. Um, and just so you guys are aware, we can do one. You can do one big motion. If somebody has a problem with one of the uh, unit recommendations, we could sec, uh, pull one of them out and do a motion for like one of them. But, we can do a motion for all of it. So, do I have a motion? Yeah, I make a motion that we accept the proposal as it stands. Okay, Dusty has made a motion to uh, accept the statewide health management plan. That's correct. Okay, as proposed by the division. Do I have a second? And it has uh, been uh, seconded by Natasha. We'll just start with the vote down the end with Dusty. Yes. Okay. Richie? Yes. Rebecca? Yes. Nate? Yes. Natasha? Yes. Richard? Yes. Mark? Yes. Okay. Online, we'll start with Jake. Yes. Jim? Uh, I kind of, kind of in between here, because uh, are we trying to bring the elk back or are we making another hunt to kill them, kill them more? Increase, Jim. Proposal to increase numbers on eight units. Is that is that to kill more or to raise more? Raise more. Yeah, I'm for it. And if we're if we're gonna put uh, more uh, animals out on the range so people can see more animals and have a bigger success rate, because I've had a lot of your public come to me and say if it wasn't for the tribe, they wouldn't have an elk hunt. So, you know, I think some of you guys really need to stop and talk to your public uh, and, and get more uh, input from them because they'll tell you something different than what Randall's telling you, the elk ain't there. Yeah, this would increase them. Yeah, this will be an increase and it gives us another tool. So, are you, yes, or are you in favor? Yeah, if it's if like I said, if it's to grow more, yeah, I'm on board. Okay, Eric. Yes. 
Okay, the motion passes uh, unanimously. Okay, we will move on to the uh, coaching reporter reward permit rule reservation by Wyatt uh, Rebank. I just want to just give a quick summary, real quick. So, this rule revision proposal uh, looks to make four general changes. First one deals with Cooper permits that are part of this rule. If they're passing a House Bill 469, the state doesn't have Cooper permits anymore, so it's not applicable to the rule. So we'd just be looking to remove that from this rule. Um, we'd look to add more protections for reporting parties where safety or, or other factors are concerned. Uh, the rule currently doesn't address or allow for exceptions for individuals that may report multiple reports in a year, certainly not three or more, which are which are rare, but they do occur. So we added a, an addition to the rule that would allow for uh, appropriate compensation, not in the form of money, but in the form of a permit for those who report multiple reports in a year. And then the last one would be to kind of broaden the scope of charges that would be eligible for a reward permit. So right now, as written, uh, prior to the proposal, you have to have a long construction charge in order to qualify for a coaching reward permit. Uh, that's a pretty high standard uh, with how we view and enforce long construction across the state. And so we're looking to add the unlawful take of the trophy animal as another eligible permit. Uh, unlawful take is a more common uh, violation and, and oftentimes more appropriately charged for certain situations that we encounter. Um, but to keep the intent of the rule as far as uh, rewards go, we tie it to a trophy. Okay, is there any questions from the rack? I have a quick question on the clarification of the, uh, the consequence. What are the, and I apologize if it's the state, it would still be like a class, what class B misdemeanor to the felony for that and want to take the trophy would be the same as the want destruction? Yeah, so want destruction is uh, is most. I'll provide a summary kind of what those two different codes are in these areas. One destruction is certainly the most powerful code we have in wildlife law. It uh, comes with longer suspension durations if you charge long destruction, and it has higher severity crimes in most cases, up to and including the felony. So unlawful take charge is much more commonly used. Um, and I can give examples of both if you need if you need to provide some helpful information on what those <coughs> Two different examples of comparisons would be, but uh, unlawful takes captive the class B. I would mind the examples. You like the examples? Okay, so uh, let's say in a, a more extreme example for one destruction would be someone that doesn't have a license that shoots a deer at night with a spotlight in January, uh, just blatantly, intentionally trying to abuse the resource and having no regard for laws or regulations. Uh, uh, an unlawful take charge that we may encounter, and again, these have varying degrees within each scope, but just for the sake of explanation here, an unlawful take violation we may encounter is someone has a spike full elk tag and they're hunting and, and elk are moving through the trees and they don't have the time to appropriately identify a spike, shoot and kill a branch antler bull by accident just because they were Negligent. That would be more of an unlawful take uh, violation where the, the former is just blatantly out there trying to break the law, unknowing that they're breaking the law. I got a question. Go ahead, Tim. No, uh, this is this a little bit out of the ordinary, but uh, what, what is it uh, as far as the rules? Uh, I'm not too uh, keen on the rules for the state as far as uh, baiting and using corn for a bait to kill animals off from and uh, running these uh, electric feeders. Is that illegal? Yeah, I want to say it's two years ago that using bait for the tape or for the purposes of taking big game is illegal. Okay. Well, I, I probably need to speak to one of you guys then. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think uh, I, I need to speak to one of you officers about what's going on over on this uh, 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 LaPointe side. Well, this uh, presentation will probably be valuable. 
may or may not qualify for what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not looking for a hunt or anything. It's just uh, if it's not right, it's not right. Yeah, for sure. Reach out to us. We'd be happy to hear what you have going on. I, I, I definitely will. I'll give you a go. I was going to ask Tim if uh, the tribe would do a poaching reward permit if we, uh, no. you know, look over and. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I think it's starting to get to that that uh, you know maybe we're going to have to start reaching out to some of the public and maybe we're going to have to come up with some kind of a reward to. Uh, compensate some of these folks because a lot of it's going on on us yeah um my I, other question i had sorry was do you feel like that change will like do you can't have any idea on numbers of permits that might be given versus the, from the old to the new is it going to double it or what do you think yeah so statewide if I went over like a five-year average, we maybe average six or seven of these a year, maybe. Um, with the inclusion of the unlawful take of a trophy animal, I I don't know that I can actually estimate that, but I'd be really surprised if it went over fifteen or twenty. Like, and and that's I don't think we'd hit those numbers every year. We may get to have some years that hit those numbers, but I don't think we'd be calling get up to that twenty every year. Thanks. Thank you. Have uh, your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, how often is a uh, is a lot of these charges get dropped down to an unlawful take charge by like the uh, the, the district attorneys and that, or is, is that yeah, expected? Yeah, that's not uncommon um, for attorneys to uh, reduce the charges. Typically, not always that. I'll kind of explain this process, I guess. So when we get a case that we screen with the county attorney, we'll collect all the, the evidence and the facts of the case, and then we'll turn that over to the county attorney. And in that, we'll have whatever charge we're recommending there. And when they look at that case, um, they'll decide there's enough there to pursue conviction. And if they pursue conviction, they'll file charges. And you just have to have the filing of charges to qualify for a reward from it, either one structure or unlawful take the trophy animal if this goes through. But commonly, when things are put down, it's put down after the charges are filed through the plea abeyance or, or some other agreement that they strike with the defense prosecuting attorney. So we'll see charges filed, and then the final conviction will be something different than the charges that were originally filed. Well, all a person has okay. to permit is have charges filed against the other people. Correct. Right? Yeah. And I'll take a second to explain different things charges and conviction, I did most of it, but yeah, so there's a difference between charging and convicting. Convicting is when you're actually convicted of the crime in front of a jury or, or a judge. Uh, charges is simply what is required for the prosecutor to get the conviction from. So yeah, it doesn't have to be a conviction, and we've issued reward permits for cases where they were charged initially and then even completely dismissed at the end. Um, they just have to have or a citation issue qualifying. Uh, I have a quick question. I mean, maybe it's a silly question, but what about like protecting the identity of a reporting party, like indemnification issues, uh, yeah. keeping anonymous uh, sources? So we, we do really well with if people wish to be anonymous, keeping them anonymous. Um, that's common practice for us. We have that regularly every single year. Uh, our reporting systems, we have a, a texting option and a call-in option. The texting option is completely anonymous unless you want it not be. Um, it's a little bit harder to issue a permit to someone who don't know who that is, obviously. But uh, this question was asked in the northern region on a, a little bit different scale. But um, as far as civil matters, there's not clear law on what protections are there in Utah. There are in other states. But... Um, so the reporting party is protected to, in some degree in a court process, but not necessarily initially when they're reported. But uh, we have not had a concern with that, at least that I'm aware of. But there's not state law, as I understand right now, that clearly protects the reporting party. 
there isn't a judicial hearing like a court proceeding. Is there a possibility that the reporting party would be called to testify or their yeah. identity would be released in any sort of way? Uh, there's a possibility they'd be called to testify if it comes down to uh, protecting a reporting party or losing the case, we often would just lose the case in order to protect the identity. And that's common. If, if our case completely hinges on the testimony of a reporting party, um, that reporting party doesn't have the identity. It just seemed like a um, society right now. Yeah, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Jake. Uh, could you just remind us all what the definition of a trophy animal is for like deer and elk? Yeah, a deer is any any deer 24 inches or bigger. Uh, trophy elk is an elk that has six points or more on one side. Have you guys considered making a, a change to like a, a Boone and Crockett inches on that? Because there's a lot of trophy animals that doesn't meet that definition of 24 inches. Yeah, I, I, we, we've had off and on internal discussions on that, and ultimately we just landed at 24 inches because it's pretty clear and easy where you don't have to have a, a Boone and Crockett certified score or get into the discussion of the, the 60 day drive period. Um, those types of things. So it's all natural at 24 inches, but, but I, I recognize and we have had discussions in the past that, that, that needs to change it, but ultimately it's not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen in like your posting trailer that you guys have at the expo where there was two deer killed, and the one deer wasn't even considered a trophy, and it was uh, a lot bigger than the one that was considered the trophy. So it is something I think that could be added to that to enhance that rule. And just to be clear, that would be a legislative change, and not something we could do to a rack and board. No way. So I told a couple of hunters that I would bring this up last track and it just ran out of time, but then it's somewhat related but a little off. <clears throat> they feel like there needs to be some clarification on what a legal take is on a spike. Um, for example, the hunter found a 6.4 on one side, beautiful, didn't even try to grill anything on the other side. He needs to come and talk to the division. He talked to one of the officers. The officer wasn't sure either. He ran it up the chain and come back to do find the issue. Um, so just just the heads up, probably need to clarify the legal take status in this fight on the Yeah, so that, that's clarified as it basically can't have a branch above the ear on one side. So it could have two brow tines, let's say, and it may mean the brakes. As long as there's not a fork above the ear on one side, it's just a legal spike by definition. So we do clarify it, but there's still some confusion. You might just take another look. Yeah. Uh, question. Um, can you just explain? I, I'm not sure how this all works. So can you explain if somebody reports um, and they, they find somebody has poached an animal on a certain unit, how does the division determine what type of tag they give that? Re recipient, what unit it's on, how that works. Yep. So let's say uh, you hunt the oak creeks or, or <laughs> looking for sheds on the oak creeks or on coyotes, whatever it may be, and you see someone shoot and kill an animal that you know is illegal for one reason or another. They report that to us, we collect the evidence, we turn it over, and the county attorney files charges on uh, currently a law destruction, let's say, based on that's what some did. Uh, that person would qualify for a reward permit on the oak creeks for the species and sex in which the report is there. And then there, the rule does go in to more detail as far as if a unit doesn't qualify, you know, it has to have five public permits, or excuse me, 10 public permits on the unit to qualify as a eligible permit or an eligible unit for a permit. And if it doesn't have that, you go to the next closest like unit. And so there's a, a trickle down process that the unit doesn't qualify. Generally speaking, <coughs> on the unit for the sex of species, which was the way you said. Is there any more questions from the rack? Yeah, I had a question concerning that. Uh, what Richie was talking about as far as the elk antlers, 
it's not seven inches or under anymore. It's considered the way you said it. Yeah, I like having both uh, eyebrows and one main beam that's under the length of the ear. I think uh, there's differences between differentiating between like a, a calibre or a, a button and a doe. And oh yeah, yeah. That's that's what I was I was uh, referring to is you know what what was uh, considered a uh, spike uh, a cow. Yeah. So if we often don't have that issue with elk because their spikes are plenty long enough. But I want to say that that's five inches there. I'd have to look. But for deer, it's five inches. If the antler's less than you know five inches or less, it's considered a doe. Yeah, because I know I know when that first came out, it was like uh, anything under seven inches was considered a cow. I don't know if that still stood or not. I it, I haven't uh, kept up on that for a while. Yeah, so what's the length on a cow? It's from very uh, five, yeah, five inches for a cow. But then you have a defin different definition for a spike versus a branch antler. Yeah, yeah. Explain that. <laughs> All right, so thank you. One more question. These tags that are, that are given out to these that are turned into poachers, where do they come out of? Are they additional tags? Do they come out of the public? No, nope, they're on top of the public. Uh -huh. So if the unit has 10 public drop tags and the reward permits issued on the unit is the for them. Okay, we'll move on to, if there are no more questions, Iraq. Is there any questions from the public? Okay, is there um, to be any questions there? I don't believe we had any electronic comments from the public on this, did we? We, we had the four people respond and they were all strongly agreed. Nobody made any specific comments about the And there was no public comment cards for this one. So we can move on to the RAC comment discussion or we feel like we filled that, we can call for a motion as well. There's any comments? Call for a motion then. I'll make a motion to accept um, the division's proposal. I have a motion from Natasha to accept the division's proposal. Is uh, do I have a second? Nate seconds it. Um, we will go through a vote. We'll start with Dusty. Uh, yes. Richie. Yes. Rebecca. Yes. Nate. Yes. Natasha? Yes. Richard? Yes. Mark? Yes. Uh, Jake? Yes. Hey, Tim? Yeah, I'm with it. Hey, Eric? Yes. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Okay, we have um, one more. Um, it's a informational uh, regional presentation on the researching endangered wood fin in the Virgin River, or is that just South That was just South okay. Regional. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I guess we don't have any other actions or anything. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Make a motion to adjourn. I have a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. Everybody in favor? Yes. Okay, we're adjourned. Just one <laughs>